13, so we're going to pick it up at uh, file item 14 this morning. I'd like to begin with retaking the uh, roll, beginning with council member Tatayan. Tatayan here. PFO here. Fiorini here. Eisenberg here. We have four, we have a quorum. We shall proceed. Um, Jessica, uh, comments regarding file item 14, Delta Levy's investment strategy. Uh, I know this is our routine update. I think we're going to start with a summary of the October 12th work session, and then we have a um, white paper, a draft white paper that uh, we will present to you, and then kind of a general updates and a, also a revised schedule of the program. Okay. Turning it over to Dan Ray. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, with your permission, I think we might do it in the opposite order, if that's all right. But. I wanted to start by introducing uh, Dar Darcy Austin. She's our uh, leads our uh, um, adaptive management unit. She's got a. She's been with us now maybe what year? Uh, less than a year. Yeah, but she came to us from the USGS, where she'd worked for six years, and prior to that, she was part of the CalFed Science Program and also worked for the San Diego Regional Water Board. And she's got her graduate degrees from San Diego State. Um, you'll recall that one of the issues that was raised when we uh, began working on the levy investment strategy issue paper was the way in which fish and wildlife habitat was protected, impacts to it were mitigated when levees were built. And we had quite a bit of testimony, uh, particularly from Indelta RDs about those issues, concerned about the costs of those activities. So we had asked the science program to do a review of the um, information available about what the, those efforts had accomplished and what they cost and suggestions about improving them. And so they've completed a draft of that review. And Darcy's the principal author, so I, she's going to brief us on it. Okay, thank you, Dan, and good morning to Chair Fiorini and the Council. Good morning, um, Darcy. I, I am just going to correct this really quickly. Um, this was a team effort, not just with the science program, but also with our planning division. And um, uh, it took a few months for us to get together. Um, uh, but we first want to announce that we have a uh, public comment period open for this draft paper, and it began on October 15th, and it will run through November. 13th and staff will be requesting endorsement of the issue paper in January and as a bit of context the Delta levies issue paper that the council endorsed last winter pointed out the ways in which state law requires that improvement projects on levies and uh, deltas on project levies and Delta non-project levies include provisions for fish and wildlife habitats for project levies, the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan describes structural and non-structural ways to promote natural hydro, uh, hydrologic and geomorphic processes, increase riparian woodland, right, I'm sorry, riparian wetland, floodplain, and shaded riverine aquatic habitat, and promote the recovery and stability of native species. And this is pursuant to Water Code Section 9616. The draft of the Flood Protections Plan conser uh, conservation strategy has been prepared recently and the council's planning staff and science program staff came together and provided comments on that conservation strategy. Within the Delta, uh, under the subventions and special flood control projects programs, there's a dual commitment to levees and fish and wildlife, which also provides a foundation for collaboration between local levee maintaining agencies and the Department of Water Resources and Department of Fish and Wildlife. Improvements to project levies and non-project levies that are funded by Delta Levy Special Projects Program must be consistent with a net long-term habitat improvement program and have a net benefit for aquatic species in the Delta as determined by the Department of Fish and Wildlife. State-funded levy improvement projects must protect fish and wildlife habitat, fully mitigate any damage to channel islands or berms with significant riparian habitat, and not result in a net long-term loss of riparian fisheries or wildlife habitat. And as provided by Water Code Sections 12314 and 12987, the Department of Fish and Wildlife ensures that there is no net loss of and 
long-term improvement of fish and wildlife habitat in conjunction with state-sponsored levy work. Um, I'm sure you're all aware that implementation of levy-related habitat projects faces a variety of regulatory and liability constraints due in part to the need to balance flood risk uh, reduction and habitat improvements. The council will recall when you were considering the Delta levy issue paper that we heard from a lot of the uh, local Delta reclamation districts about how these provisions of state law affect their improvements, levy improvements, as well as some suggestions about ways to improve implementation of these provisions. So with that long bit of context, I, I will uh, remind everyone that uh, we uh, had a request from Carl Wilcox back at the February council meeting to, pre to perform this review. And one of our first steps was to convene an advisory committee and this included folks from California Department of Wildlife, Department of Water Resources, Delta Conservancy, National Marine Fishery Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and Reclamation District representatives, which included some of the Delta engineers. Um, and our research team, as I mentioned before, did include uh, council staff, the planning staff, and science program staff, uh, and two of which were our Sea Grant fellows. Uh, what we did was we coordinated with the state agencies and other stakeholders and we obtained descriptions of completed levy related habitat projects and we received and reviewed about 15 projects but they included multiple sites. Um, the sites can be found in appendix 5 of the full reports so if you want to take a look at those. We evaluated the project effectiveness in terms of their stated objectives, if they had performance measures, monitoring and results, and whether or not there was a demonstrated benefit to uh, species. And what we learned uh, was that the majority of the reports used vegetation monitoring as a means of evaluating success. And um, there were not a lot of fish and wildlife data available in these projects, and uh, in many cases, the, the existing data were not consistent among the projects, so we weren't able to compare the effectiveness of different habitat type, uh, habitat improvement projects. But we do want to emphasize that there were no requirements at that time to um, perform wildlife monitoring and many of these projects were done before the Delta Plan was adopted and uh, the adaptive management framework that we have now. Similarly to the, the environmental data, we had um, issues trying to accurately assess the cost of different habitat options associated with these uh, levy enhancement uh, projects. One of the things that we, we learned was that there are many challenges associated with uh, setback levies, especially in the Delta. But uh, modifying existing levies to extra wide levies may be a more cost effective option and may be more likely to be supported by landowners. Um, and in lieu or in combination with a setback levy or an extra wide levy, a planting bench on the waterside slope may be installed to establish channel margin habitat. Um, now this just basically allows a little bit of habitat to be on the water side of the levy without compromising the structural integrity of the levee, so you get a little bit of habitat benefit along with your flood protection. Our recommended next steps, we have seven of them. I, I think maybe one of them wasn't included in the staff report, so I'll just note that one. The first, the first one, which is in your staff report, is apply the adaptive management framework to future projects, and this is to facilitate scientific learning and reduce uncertainties. And the one I think th that is missing is develop appropriate monitoring and performance measures. And if you're looking at the full report, it can be found on page 43. Um, and this just allows us to assess effectiveness in providing benefits to target species. Our third recommended next step is to track the incremental cost of habitat improvements. So segregating those costs, which was what we had a sort of a gross cost estimate or cost number that we were that we received from the agencies. So if they segregated the cost, it would help us understand how funds have been invested in improving habitat in the Delta. 
Our fourth next step is to carefully consider trade-offs associated with on-site and off-site mitigation, and that kind of works in two different ways. Um, it's important to ensure that mitigation takes into consideration the life history requirements of the target species. In other words, if you're trying to mitigate for salmon, lo loss of salmon habitat, it's better to mitigate on the channel margin in the migratory corridor. And then on the flip side, there are other considerations that you might want to um, factor in, such as the size and complexity that it would be offer, offered by um, supporting a mitigation bank. Number five, we have use landscape scale planning to guide project siting and design. In general, larger and more complex habitats will serve to benefit a wider array of wildlife. Then number six, measure fish and wildlife response through a standardized regional monitoring program. So instead of developing these monitoring programs on a project by project basis, you get more bang for your buck and you get um, more uh, a better look at if the effectiveness of these projects if you do it on a regional, uh, um, on a regional basis. Uh, number seven, continue to use the Delta Levy Habitat Advisory Committee as a venue to discuss incorporation of these habitat improvement components into levees projects. And this group is comprised of representatives from the Department of Water Resources, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, some of the reclamation districts, including the engineers and other stakeholders. And um, it's just an opportunity for those folks to collaborate and um, plan a and adaptively implement habitat projects under their jurisdiction. So overall, um, council staff's role will be moving forward to uh, report on performance measures, including the extent of newly constructed shaded riverine aquatic and riparian forest habitat and use of those restored habitats by uh, target species. For the planning division specifically, uh, they would like to work to incorporate the findings of the levy related habitat review into the Delta levy investment strategy. Um, for example, to the design of conceptual projects, cost ranges for environmental measures, possible recommendations regarding increased funding for monitoring habitat effectiveness and then to provide early consultation on covered actions, which would help project proponents understand their requirements to have an adaptive management plan, and also for their CEQA mitigation measures to be at least as effective as what is called for in the Delta plan. As far as the science program staff, uh, we provide adaptive management liaisons, and we are happy to advise project proponents on uh, during project development, and we work very closely with our planning staff staff to do that. Uh, we will provide support for a regional adaptive management program, including um, support in requesting for that funding um, that it would be so important to, to have a regional monitoring focus. Um, and I, I just wanted to build on this concept of regional monitoring. It's something that isn't just for habitat pro or levy related habitat projects, it's for a lot of habitat projects. And in fact, um, you may have heard this from David Okita from Eco Restore. Um, and through the interagency ecological program, um, that is, this, there's an effort led by the Department of Fish and Wildlife through their fish restoration monitoring program. Uh, and we want to build on the work that they're doing to create a framework for regional monitoring. And they're focusing on tidal wetlands at this time, so we would like to build on that progress and uh, incorporate a look at other habitats, including floodplains, but also um, levee-related projects. And a number of folks, including folks from DWR, are involved in this effort, and um, so I think we'll all be looking to build towards that together. And um, just one of the major benefits of monitoring, um, uh, we would like to look at future projects as well as last project or former projects that have already been implemented. And that would provide us with insights as to how those habitat improvement projects function once they're fully mature. So again, our comment period runs through November 13th. We're looking forward to receiving comments. We've received some already, um, specifically uh, Brian Atwater from the Delta Independent Science Board and maybe some others by now. 
Um, if endorsed in January, we would uh, like to share this review with our agency partners and also share with the DPIC and the Delta Agency Science Work Group, and then also transmit this uh, to the Delta Independent Science Board for their opinion on it. And that's it. Are there any questions? Questions of Darcy? Yes, Susan? Is this the time to go to the report itself? Sure. Oh, okay. Um, thank you, Darcy. I think this is going to be, and already is actually, a very useful report. I'm curious if a distinction in the analysis was made between cost for mitigation versus cost for a net benefit gain in, in habitat, and if the report will try and separate the two. Yes, there there are cost. There's a cost breakdown for both of those. So um, I, I don't have the exact page number, but it is in the full report. I could point that out a little later during a break. So is, is that the table on page six? No. Uh, well, you're probably looking at the executive summary, right. um, but the full report contains more detail oh, on okay. the cost information. And in fact, you can have my copy if you'd like, and um, I'll point you to the, the proper pages to see that Oh, I'll breakdown. get it later. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Phil? Uh, yeah. Is this, is this the... Uh, all we're going to be talking about in levy investment strategy, or are we getting to other parts of it as well? Um, once we're done with this section, then Dustin will bring us up to date with where we're at with other elements of the project. Uh, okay. Um, just, a, just a note, which I'd missed on the agenda. You've so cited uh, the wrong code sections for the levy investment strategy. You've got in definitions of adaptive management and co-equal goals as the code section on the agenda. And those aren't the code sections on the investment strategy. Phil, they did that just to see if you were reading your material. Well, I, did, I, did, I should have read, I, I should have uh, looked at it more carefully, but I did. I did this morning because I didn't understand this discussion. Let Let me uh, ask follow up on Susan's question on the summary analysis, which is page five and page six, where you've made some observations about cost analysis. Uh, you refer to, a, uh, you say, the true cost of restoring repair to inhabitants is still uncertain. Is true cost a term of art in expenditures, or what is that? You know, I unfortunately don't have an answer to, to that. I didn't do the cost uh, work myself, so I don't have an answer, but we can get that for you. Okay. Uh, is, is, by the way, I like the, what was it, five, six, now seven uh, points that you're talking about. I think that's a good way to, to analyze the issue. But I was uh, puzzled about how you rank the, um, the order appearing on page three and four. Many other challenges in doing a setback levy not unique to the Delta, which include finding willing landowners to provide the land, uh, complications in protecting existing structures, easements, utilities, increased cost and time necessary for project design and permitting. As I understand it, that is entirely taken from the work done by this interagency committee and Fish and Wildlife on pursuant to their independent statutory review. Or is this our staff's evaluation? Yeah, this is our okay. staff's evaluation. Is it more important or less important to have willing landowners than other features? Is it more important or less important to have a cost-benefit ratio that's re I mean, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't determine what judgments are made as to the elements that are there. Well, the, the willing landowners is uh, important for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that almost all these projects are proposed by local reclamation districts seeking state money. And of course their property owners are the voters of the district. The state doesn't have any way to compel people through the Delta levies programs or um, 
through the flood control project, uh, maybe some, but not but a lot, the, the, to, to, to pursue a project that the local entity is not interested in. And so just in terms of acceptability of the project and the project sponsor's desire to, to further it, uh, the willingness of the landowners is really important. Well, then let me ask a question. Are the, is the state money that's allocated for these projects a legal entitlement to the property owners, the private property owners? No, these are grants that are made to okay, the local so, reclamation. District. And does the state set c terms and conditions on grants? Certainly. Okay, so to say that the state has no control over what a proposal is, doesn't really recognize the, the fact that the state may set conditions and does set conditions for receiving the grant money. They do set conditions, certainly, yeah. As it relates to this issue, though, uh, a condition that said you must set back a levy, for example, might well result in the local district saying, well, that's the requirement. We may not pursue it. Okay, but, but, and, and the consequence of that would be? Well, the consequence of that might be several things. It might be uh, uh, un unimproved levies. It might be threats to properties and in interests that the state as well as others have. It also might be loss of an opportunity to improve fish and wildlife habitat because you might be left with a levy that doesn't provide useful habitat immediately at the channel side. And how am I to interpret the staff memo in terms of your recommendation of a levy investment strategy that we're supposed to recommend to the state legislature and the governor uh, by two th whatever the date is on the new schedule. I mean, what are we saying about that option? It should remain within the discretion of the local levy districts, and if nobody's interested in it, it should not be pursued. We haven't drafted those uh, portions of the plan yet. I mean, the next way that um and certainly we'll be looking for feedback from you and others though, as we do that. The, the next step in using this information is partly um, as we complete the evaluation of the various risks in the Delta, as well as begin to consider where our priorities uh, for investment in terms of what are the highest priority islands and tracks. Then as we start to think through uh, with people uh, in the Delta and others, what are potential projects that might be effective in reducing those risks and, and getting the other benefits that w we seek out of the levy program. Um, what are ways, what are potential projects that might do that? So this will inform uh, that assessment of potential projects, you know, they call them investment concepts sometimes in our discussion. Um, and then uh, also I think some of the recommendations that they have here about the ways of uh, the, these programs should be gathering information and reporting results will probably also be recommendations that we'll suggest to be part of the levy investment strategy. Well, just, just focusing on the six now seven uh, bulleted points in the summary report starting on page six, is it, is it, may I read this fairly by saying a condition of receiving grant funds should be the inclusion of a state approved adaptive management framework? Well, if these were projects that were covered actions in the Delta, they would need to have um, an adaptive management program that met the standards in the Delta plan today. Uh, if, 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 if the report is intended to provide a structure that helps us on our levy investment strategy and for covered actions, it is the staff's view that adaptive management should be a requirement. It is a requirement. Well, it is a requirement, then when it says next steps, it, it doesn't read as if we're developing this as part of a levy investment strategy to recommend to the state. It reads as if somehow this is things they should consider doing in the future. And you don't mean that. You mean that for levy investments, I assume, the state should require adaptive management frameworks. Well, I think there's many different ways that could be written at this time. Again, this is a evaluation of a, a variety of projects conducted 
both by the science program and by the planning division. It's going to inform the recommendations we bring to you through the levy investment strategy, but these aren't at this time, or well, these are recommended uh, policies, regulatory policies, or, or recommendations to be added to the Delta plan. We're not there yet. Well, but some of them are already in the Delta plan. That's correct, yeah. Um, I guess it's fair to say that as a critique of what's gone on in the past, I think I understand this, but as a tool for what's in our investment strategy to recommend, I don't have a clue what these mean. Well, there's a couple things then uh, we could talk about. One is they've identified certain types of project designs that, uh, particularly through monitoring that's been done um, through the Sacramento Area Flood Control Authority, uh, do seem to have promise for effectively enhancing f habitat for anadromous fish along uh, the, ch the margins of levees. Uh, second, they've got some recommendations about how to track costs and the importance of providing uh, sufficient funds for uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation. If we're recommending an investment strategy, that might be an important point we want to um, include. Uh, they've also um, uh, called for a, a regional monitoring framework that would need to be developed. Right now, we, we don't have one for these sorts of issues. I mean, it's difficult even to find uh, consistent information about the condition of the levees today in terms of their channel margin uh, qualities. And then I think um, Finally, and this gets to a point that uh, both the local reclamation districts have raised as well as I think Council Member Johnston also uh, raised it, thinking through the appropriateness of uh, kind of regional approaches to ha habitat enhancement in these areas, perhaps, perhaps mitigation banks or other regional strategies as opposed to just uh, small project by project mitigation actions. So that's another thing that I think we'll be thinking about as we bring the investment strategy uh, yeah. uh, towards, towards you. Dan, are these seven bullet points here ones that you think will sh should be part of the definition of a net long-term habitat improvement program as required by this separate, separate from the council yeah. legislation on fish and wildlife uh, habitat evaluation? Yeah, I think they would be helpful. You know, that, that program's been operating for many years under right. agreements that were uh, developed in the 90s. It might be time to look again and see if those are still good guides. I mean, it, it, it strikes me that um, the general discussion on levees within the Delta views habitat restoration as a, an afterthought to the actual improvement of levees by most interest, certainly by the Reclamation District, not unimportant, but not fully legally required. It is legally required, but it hasn't been, is it fair to say it hasn't been pushed as a major priority? Uh, you know, I've, I've not been involved in the details of how the program's operated, so I, don't, I wouldn't be fair for me to offer an opinion on that. Okay. Susan. In, in listening to Phil's comments, it strikes me that one thing that would be really useful is a very uh, clear, crisp statement about the Council's uh, perspective on habitat restoration and meeting the co-equal goals and in the context of financing what would be useful is um, knowing in a in investing in a levy is this habitat component of the levy whether it's 15 percent or 30 percent whatever is it merely mitigation compensating for negative impacts or was it actually uh, part of the project design to enhance or restore uh, a key component of the ecosystem such that there is recovery of species rather than just merely mitigating for damage done? And my third tier uh, ideal would be that this regional perspective and the landscape scale vision um, through grant criteria and other mechanisms, we would encourage 
that these projects actually design ecosystem enhancement into the project rather than merely mitigate and contribute to the net benefit gain in habitat. And I hope that was clear. I'll, I'll echo those. I want uh, those comments. I think, that, Susan, that's the good suggestion. Um, I read the report and I, I, I was very pleased. I thought this was great work. It provides uh, an inventory of the kinds of things that we mention in, in support through the Delta Plan that, that most experts agree, you've got to have performance measures, you've got to have adaptive management plans, um, landscape scale um, planning and regional monitoring are, are critical if we are going to gain the knowledge that we need from these investments to apply in the, in the future. I, I thought that um, the discussion about on-site versus off-site mitigation was a real practical uh, question. It, it does cause one to wonder if you're concerned about a particular issue, but you're spending money in improving something someplace else. Does that really make sense? And then the cost, uh, tracking costs, another practical observation. I would suggest that beyond tracking costs, that uh, as part of our covered action program, <laughs> which, which uh, this also suggests that the, the covered action authority is driving uh, conversations that wouldn't otherwise occur. And it brings uh, a, a multiple interests together around a particular project with a vision towards the future. Um, that suggests that there, there needs to be a little more rigor added to budgeting. As we talk about the, the monitoring needs, the data evaluation, collection and evaluation needs, um, that's, that's an issue in terms of next steps that should be a, a, a part of the, the recommendations. Um, channel margin and the committee that, that has been formed. I think um, the committee is, uh, to get to one of Phil's concerns about, you know, where is this headed, this committee uh, hopefully will have uh, a long life. And it, it brings uh, different interests that have uh, differing views about the benefit of setback levies in particular and um, in channel margin habitat. Uh, we know from the work we've done with levy investment strategy work that the locals feel that the, the money that they receive from the state is best spent on levy improvements and often question the value of, of habitat work. Uh, and particularly with setback levies, we know from the Delta Plan work that we've done that the opportunities are pretty limited in the Delta, or, well, not pretty, but they're, not every levy uh, lends itself to um, being set back. This, um, this thought about the widening of levees uh, and, and having less impact on uh, landowners and the, the land side is intriguing to me. And with the, the, the committees, including the agencies, as well as the RDs and the local engineers, this is a way to begin um, developing the kind of trust that George Hartman was talking about yesterday that we need to have between these regulatory requirements and in Delta users and, and, and local expertise. So I think what you've done in this report is identified a lot of really good opportunities, uh, set a vision for the kinds of activities that need to occur, but um, I think we would all agree that uh, establishing meaningful performance measures, creating an adaptive management program, uh, land scale, landscape scale planning and regional monitoring are at this point more aspirational than they are uh, actual. So I, I, uh, I, I thought the, the work was really well done. <coughs> Any other comments or questions? I have uh, I want to raise an unrelated, a related issue to this. It's what Dan and I talked about yesterday, but it's under the the staff memo discussion under next steps. Why don't we, we, why don't we let Dustin bring us up to date, and then maybe okay. have a time to do that. All right. Okay, so we're ready to shift to the next step. Darcy, thank you. Dustin, thank you. It's all yours. All right. So the biggest topic today that we're going to talk about regarding the Delta Levy Investment Strategy is a revised project schedule. 
As you know, we've been including the project schedule as an ongoing item within our uh, monthly reports. We've been kind of hedging our bets on the schedule as we've been working forward. We've known for a while, or for at least the last month or so, that some potential issues could be coming up, and we've been working through those with our partner agencies. Over the last month or so, I think we've got to uh, at least an understanding of where we're at working with our partner agencies and how that's going to affect our schedule moving forward. So just starting at the highest level, I think the immediate item that you'll notice with the schedule from the previous months that we've submitted is that the schedule has been extended from June of 2016 through March of 2017, or about an increase of about nine months or so. Some of the items towards the end um, you know, are naturally a little bit more uh, um, hopefully optimistic as we move out there or uh, we might be able to tighten up the schedule as we move forward. But the biggest item in that nine month change has been the item, um, if you look on your schedule, the, in the analysis section, reviewing and responding to peer review panel recommendations and refined methods as panel recommendations, um, uh, per panel recommendation, sorry, and partner agency coordination. That, along with the risk analysis, has been stretched considerably from when we have been worked previously. Um, we added about an additional, I think, four to five months to that process. And we had hoped to accomplish those steps in August. Um, as far as refining our methodology, as you probably remember, in July, we received an independent scientific uh, panel review of our methodology that was developed. Um, we felt that we're pretty confident that we'd be able to address those panel comments. Um, some of the main items that we were going to address were the water supply metrics, if you remember from our October 12th presentation, the habitat metric, and also adding an item for uh, Delta as a place. Uh, we felt like we had a good handle on those, and immediately after the July recommendations from the Independent Scientific Review Panel, we had some technical experts and a um, an invitation-only workshop to work through our proposed revised metrics. Um, so we think we have a good methodology moving forward. However, our partner agencies are reviewing those in more in-depth and on how they are actually implemented within our decision support tool right now. Um, so our partner agencies are not only looking at the methodology that's been developed, but also how it's been implemented, implemented sorry, within the decision support tool and how the calculations will be done and how that will affect the outcome and potentially how the tool will be used. So working with our partners, um, we feel th or they have told us that they will be getting back to us in December with their review of our decision support tool and the calculations in there and how we are implementing the methodology. Um, so once that's done, we'll be able to move forward with the remaining steps, and that will be the conceptual project design that Darcy's work, as she mentioned, is playing into how we could um, work in the habitat information that they've brought forward, along with developing other potential projects. One of the items that our consultants is looking at is bringing the Delta levies up to a PL8499 standard, how much that will cost and what the risk reduction will be for, as a benefit for that. Um, but we want to hold off on moving too far into those analysis until we reach this agreement with our partner agencies and make sure everybody's on board um, so that we don't have a significant core shift um, once we're into the analysis. So that's the biggest item as far as the analysis. And as you can see through the schedule, the, the extended analysis portion ripples through the other items. That'll include the strategy and policy develop. I'm sorry, not the policy development. Um, yeah, sorry, the strategy and policy section, and also the CEQA items and the OAL, um, the report to the legislature that we'll be preparing also. Also on the analysis side, I just want to mention that after our October 12th workshop and Throughout the process as we've been going, uh, one of the things that we've been hearing is that we should take more time to engage the locals and have this extensive outreach effort as we're working through. Some of the folks at the workshop uh, mentioned that they think there might be better sources of information that we're not incorporating. So we wanted to add in a little bit of time for that also. As you, one of the items that's been stretched throughout um, the analysis process now is the outreach and including public workshops and presentations. So that's not going to be a 24-7 item, but we will be touching on that throughout the months um, as we extend throughout the entire analysis. So we hope to do a lot more stakeholder engagement and making sure we're incorporating the best available data that is available for our use.
Um, the other item I'll just touch on with the analysis is that we've allowed a little bit more time for um, deliberation with the council. I think in the previous project schedule, we had rolled in not just the, um, the risk analysis and consequences that you saw presented previously, but also um, deliberations of actually working through portfolios. Um, after having some of the dis our discussions, we think it would be more informative to split those out. So the council deliberations in January through March are really going to focus on the results of what we bring out of the um, risk and consequences after we've had our methodology well defined so that we can pin that down again before moving too far into our analysis. And then the council will be re-engaged once the methodology and risks are accepted when we start getting into the concept projects and portfolio development. Dustin, I should also mention that recently the chair and I met with uh, Bill Edgar, the chair of the Central Valley Flood Protection Board and their executive officer. And they have expressed an interest in holding a joint meeting or workshop. Um, the law requires us to consult with the flood board. And while we're working with them as a part of our project team, we thought that might be an appropriate suggestion to hold a public workshop jointly. Oh, I appreciate it. So you. expect Sorry. that. Thank you. Perhaps early in the next year. Right. Thank you, Jessica. Um, that's the bulk of it. I don't know how much detail. If you want me to go into more detail, we can. If you have questions about the schedule itself, I didn't. I don't. I won't touch on every line item unless you want me to. Well, let's um, see where the questions go. Okay. Questions, comments. Uh, this is something Dan and I talked about yesterday. At the end of the process, what I want to see is a tool that not only allows us to do the island by island evaluation, but also allows us to follow the direction in, the, in our enabling statute that directs us to consider non-levy flood mitigation options as alternatives. Mm -hmm. And to do that, we need to have them identified. It's what the uh, Independent Science Board panel called our options, our range of options, which they said don't close your mind on any option. Look at them all as you evaluate them. And uh, under the next steps and, and all of that, I suppose it's possible the last bullet point, develop levy improvement investment concepts, e.g., is enough. But for me, uh, I think we need more specific language that we're going to get, uh, that, we, that we want to talk about the items, whether it's, whether it's flood proofing, which is generally the elevation of existing structures or the provision of elevated land for uh, emergency response evacuation, uh, whether it's a wider bridge as with the uh, uh, Bethel Island, uh, that was one of it. I mean, it is not simply building higher and wider levees everywhere they exist just because that's what people like or are used to. It's a, it's a balanced judgment of what's the right public policy to achieve all the goals that are out there. And I don't know quite how to write it, but uh, Dan, Dan was telling me uh, yesterday, well, we can't get all the information uh, on those options that uh, are available. Uh, and you know, re realistically, we don't have clear final options, even on levy improvements. We have estimates based on past practices and best views of professionals who do it. But conventionally, they do not apply the same factors. Could an expansion of the Olo Causeway in certain parts of the Delta provide a more immediate flood protection of both life and property? than improving levees? The answer is yes or no, or maybe. And what would it cost, and what should we do? Mm -hmm. Storage reoperation, which we favor in the, uh, uh, the options that we're uh, developing that we talked about yesterday, is another way to deal with flood protection mitigation activities that may actually be hard to do, but more effective and more cost effective than a whole bunch of other things. And so for me, I want to see the product at the end lay out those, those non-levy options, which are both structural and non-structural, try to put a rough cost estimate on it, not dissimilar to the 
fish and wildlife and other evaluations of levee setbacks and so on. So we can sit down and make an intelligent recommendation to the legislature about how to, how to develop a levee investment strategy that is not simply a response to political pressure and demands to protect my property or somebody's property uh, by building levees, which yeah. is, I believe, the status quo. As, as we discussed, the, the approach we have taken, I think all along, has been that we're going to identify uh, non-structural risk reduction activities that would complement levee investments. We know that the levee investments are, you know, it can't remove all the risk, uh, and uh, there'll be areas where investments that people might like to see occur won't be cost effective or they're not as high a priority as an investment someplace else and so there won't be funds available. I think we're fully committed to identifying a set of measures that would complement the investments and levies that are part of the strategy. Uh, a challenge is that a key thing for non-structural uh, risk reduction activities is they're, they're quite, their efficacy is quite dependent on people's behavior. So you can't so easily say, oh, if we invest in an evacuation plan, here's how, it's gonna, here's how many lives it's going to save, here's how much risk is going to be reduced, because the biggest uncertainty in that is, well, what are people going to do when they get the call from the sheriff saying, time to get out? The same thing, if we can have a, a flood proofing program that would offer resources to people to raise their house and make other improvements that make it uh, less susceptible to flood damage, but whether they'll participate or not is a quite a different story. And so it's hard to identify what the efficacy of those measures would be in terms of their real reduction in risk, whereas the, uh, the efficacy of a, a levy, because it's an engineered structure and we can use engineering tools to assess how, eff how effective it's going to be, is easier to assess. So we're not going to be able to use the tool, the decision support tool, to actually identify the, um, the risk reduction measures that would be non-structural ones that would be appropriate elements of the program. But I think we can go through, identify measures that would be uh, desirable complements to the levy investments. We can ballpark their costs. I think it would make sense to take a half dozen islands and try to understand what sample costs might be. And I think that would help us understand uh, whether it made sense to recommend that a substantial or a portion of the funds that might be available for uh, flood management uh, be allocated for those activities. That would be a substantial change from current policy where almost all the money goes solely to levies and non-structural measures get very little access to resources that are available for flood management. Phil? Well, I like part of what you said. Uh, as you know, our statutory mandate on the Delta Plan says we're supposed to promote effective emergency pre preparedness, appropriate land uses, and strategic levy investments. And I'm a little concerned about the notion people won't change their behavior, they won't evacuate when the sheriff calls, because that's really, that's kind of the New Orleans de declaration. Mayor Nagan didn't want to pull the trigger and delayed the issue of, a, of an evacuation order. But even when the evacuation order was given, there were still a lot of people left. Lives were lost significantly. But the difficulty of something is not simply the answer, well, then we just have to do, do, do things that are simple, which is spend taxpayers' money for all the state of California to do something that doesn't require human behavior to change. So. Local governments can put more people in the Delta flood risk, and that's okay, we'll pay for it. People can refuse to evacuate. If they want to, we'll pay for the damage and all of that. that that's, not an, that's not an investment strategy. That's a declaration that it's politically tough and we don't want to do it. So although I, I agree with you that the options are probably, as you recommend, at the end of the day, if discretionary funds are to be set out by the legislature and the governor for uh, flood protection w within the bounds of the Delta, categories should be established that serve all of the legitimate ways to deal with it. And indirectly, that will have an impact. But we're, <coughs> we need more clarity on those options, and we need ways to evaluate the co costs and benefits that cut across the categories of spending. 
I mean, if you said, well, gee, for four billion dollars, we can get a, you know, reasonably high level of protection. It's not perfect. It's not solving all our problems. Okay, the, the public policy question is, if you had four billion dollars to spend, where would you get your biggest bang for the buck, the most effective risk reduction? probably just saying don't add more people at risk and secondarily set up an emergency response system that tries to minimize the risk of, of loss of life, which is why you focus the alternative actions in non-urban areas where if you have to evacuate 20 people, that's different from having to evacuate 20,000 people. So, Thank you. Mary. And just to tail on that uh, thread, uh, part of the human element, um, not to speak for you, Dan, you do it very well you're already, but we saw it, we see it in the fire, we see it in emergencies where people don't respond to public safety coming in and saying it's time for you to leave. That, that may be part of your point, Dan, is that yep. sometimes even though it's an emergent situation, people don't want to leave their home. They think they can solve the problem themselves or they're just too attached and they don't want to leave it behind. That's just part of the human element. Um, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to ask Dan, uh, the principles we discussed yesterday regarding water conveyance and uh, principles for operations to achieve the co-equal goals, I'm wondering how those items are carried forward into this item. Um, we're talking about levees, which are certainly a part of conveyance operations and certainly part of the water system operation, and I know we're, we're of these are still evolving, but how are they already connected or are they? Well, water supply is one of the metrics that we're evaluating, or at least the impacts on water supply uh, within our Delta Levies investment strategy. So we're trying to capture the effects of, you know, what does it take to make a sustainable supply of water, either based off of water quality, either protecting, you know, pipelines and infrastructure or through Delta Corridor. So we're looking at those different aspects of how levy improvements could uh, mitigate impacts to water supply. C certainly one of the sets of uh, investment alternatives that we'll consider would be uh, a set of investments that would uh, provide through Delta Conveyance. Provide through Delta conveyance or improve? Improve through Delta, okay. that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. And then on the ecosystem enhancement discussion that council members had earlier, how are we coordinating with the United States Army Corps of Engineers? Because they have a levy vegetation policy that creates challenges where some may see we should plant uh, vegetation on the levees that would help assist the ecosystem and the ecology of the Delta, and yet the Army Corps of Engineers at a federal level has conflict uh, with that proposal. And I think it's the details are still being worked out, uh, as I understand that, but that's an important component of what expectations are and what opportunities may be. Yeah. You're correct. It is is still being worked out and that is probably going to be a while before they actually reach a conclusion on that but that's something that would come into play I guess when we recommend levels of protection one of the items um, for example if we recommend a certain level of protection for a levy so that it could or that reclamation district could participate in federal reimbursements um, that's going to be one of the things we have to look at even if we get them to that level is there going to be a maintenance requirement for vegetation still that they would have to implement to um, to get into the rec I'm sorry the federal reimbursement program and whether or not they're willing to do that and also I guess the consequences if they did implement that vegetation um, what impacts would that have on the uh, the habitat also the, we do have the Corps of Engineers staff participating uh, on our technical teams it's a difficult issue mm -hmm. for them to work through Absolutely. because they're certainly um, the Sacramento district's not in charge of this. You know, uh, it's a nationwide issue. Mm -hmm. um, an important uh, test that will come probably sooner rather than later is going to be uh, when SAFCA tries to improve its levies uh, through the pocket, and funds have been um, offered to them uh, through the Department of Water Resources Urban Levy Program. SAFCA has got a very thoughtful approach for identifying <coughs> which trees on the levy today probably ought to be removed uh, as w and which ones can probably be retained. And so mm -hmm. I think they're going to be uh, seeking the Corps' uh, determination ab about that application and uh, that will give a, a lot of insight into approaches that might work in other reclamation districts and uh, in other communities. And are we building that? Ev evolving policy in this document, I didn't see it, so I may have missed it. I mean, do we want to refer to that 
evolution, current practice, proposed practice, and what it means to the Stewardship Council in this document, because they are very much related. Good point. In, in my opinion. And then lastly, Mr. Chairman, I think I had one more point. Um, nope, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Others? Um, one observation. It, it, it sounds to me like we need to revisit the expectations for the work of the levy investment strategy tool. Because I, I hear from Phil a desire to include uh, cost analysis of flood proofing versus levy improvements. And um, you know, I think, um, n not necessarily today, but maybe next month in the update, uh, it would be good just to review the, the conditions that were set forth when we in, uh, began the work on the levy investment tool. And, and then how these um, ancillary uh, costs or improvements, uh, cost of improvements, uh, will be evaluated uh, along with the decision support tool. Or will, in fact, they be folded into and included in the, in the decision support tool outputs? So um, just revisiting that issue and clarifying for the council what, the, what we can expect moving forward, I think, will be, uh, will be helpful. Okay. Mary? Quick point on that. Uh, Follow-up. I didn't, wasn't able to attend the council's presentation of the modeling, but I did have a, a solo ceremony with the staff on Monday, and boy, what an, an amazing program. But to that point, and we've seen the spreadsheet of the state investments in levies, levy maintenance, um, on that map modeling and being able to plug in the evaluations and then where those funds are going might be interesting to get it off the paper onto the screen in that modeling aspect. So if we're going to go back and look at it, that's something that I thought of after the, the meeting was we've seen the investment and where those dollars are going on a map, but not on the screen and then being able to plug in how much and then were those project areas, were those non-project areas, were they community-based, were they reclamation district-based, urban, ag protection, et cetera, might be a great, um, another way to view that important information. Thank you. Anything else on this matter? All right, then Darcy, Dustin, Dan, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That completes, um, presentation. Any requests for uh, comment? Very good. That completes file item 14. On to file item 15. Review of water fix and the Bay Delta Conservation Plan's partially recirculated draft EIR EIS. I'd like to welcome Vince Resch up too to um, Join me. He's representing the uh, Independent Science Board, which is a part of this review. And I just, you know, this is a discussion with you about uh, the comments that we propose you make on the recirculated BDCP uh, California Water Fix uh, partially recirculated draft EIR. And um, we've got with us uh, not just Vince, but also our team from Arcadis that helps us with this. Arcadis has been our consultant. That's how we first got to know him. Uh, long before we started working on the levy project. Uh, and so Jessica Ludi, who you met um, uh, when we uh, discussed the tool, as well as Jamie Tull, who's a, uh, one of their environmental scientists, is with us uh, today as well. And then Kayvon Sampson, I think, is here, who's been a part of the team as well. We've got with us, if, if you want, uh, if you have detailed questions, we brought a copy of the draft EIR with us, and so it's over there on the wall if you want to. Uh, either ask a detailed question or just appreciate the, the suffering that the Independent Science Board and others have gone through trying to c digest that. Um, th you know, the EIR was, re the re recirculated EIR was released uh, July 10th. Um, comments are due at the end of October, October 30th. Um, Originally, the BDCP was proposed as a 50-year natural community conservation plan that had the goal of uh, recovering um, endangered or threatened species in the Delta, partly through improved conveyance, but partly through a series of other conservation actions. 
and we reviewed the draft EIR on the, that initial proposal. It was released last December, December uh, 2013, and um, we submitted our comments on it in June of 2014. Um, in April of this year, the administration announced a new preferred alternative that would no longer complete the BDCP as a natural communities conservation plan, but instead propose just construction and conveyance facilities and a scheme for their operation. The ecosystem restoration, habitat restoration actions would were separated from the preferred alternative and they would be uh, carried out separately uh, through, the, um, through the Eco Restore initiative. And so the EIR that's been recirculated analyzes that new water fix alternative, the conveyance and its operation uh, without the other ecosystem restoration actions. And it also has two other sub-alternatives, one of which has a higher level of diversion than the preferred alternative, and one of which has a lower level of uh, diversion. And so, uh, as you know, the uh, Reform Act calls on the Independent Science Board to review the BDCP EIR and provide comments to you and to the Director of Fish and Wildlife. And they've done an admirable job, so I'll just turn it over to you. Good morning, Chair Fiorini. Welcome, Vince. Yes. Uh, as you, Dan just said, I'm here representing the membership of the Delta Independent Science Board to present our response to the draft partially revised EIR EIS. And this is included as attachment three of the uh, Council's review. Uh, as you know, by statute, the DISB is required to review the EIR EIS of the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. We did a long and thorough review of this document and submitted it to the Council in May of 2014. Given that Appendix A of the partially revised EIR EIS included revisions made to many of the points that we request in our review, we examine the document now under discussion and your response in terms of the points that were raised in our early response, and we also provided a review of additional material that was presented. Now, in many cases, the Independent Science Board was quite pleased that a number of the issues that we had raised in the initial BDCP EIR EIS were addressed in the new document. In particular, detailed information was added on the analysis of contaminants, on the problems posed by microcystis, on public health issues, and a variety of other improvements that we note in the document. However, the new document raised concerns in several areas that we felt we should draw attention to, given that we are an independent science board and given the significance of the project that's being reviewed. Our overarching concerns relate to the incompleteness of the documents in some areas and the inadequate, inadequate communication uh, of information that it conveys. Together, these deficiencies made it difficult for us as an independent science board to conduct a comprehensive evaluation of the scientific underpinnings of the proposed project and its potential effects. Our concerns about the inc incompleteness of the document is a result of several issues. First of all, discussion of some topics, such as the effects of levy failure, comparison among alternatives, the process of adaptive management, and the effects of climate change and sea level rise are deferred to the final draft. Other topics, such as the effects of the project on levee maintenance or the relationship of San, to San Joaquin Valley agriculture are not addressed adequately and that they doing so would be presumed to be too speculative. Finally, a robust, a robust and detailed assessment of how the project might be affected by climate change and sea level rise is lacking because these changes are now incorporated in the no action, the, the baseline alternative. In general, we felt that the revised EIR EIS provides only the information analysis that are legally required for such documentation. To the Delta Independent Science Board, this falls far short of what is needed to assess the project's effectiveness, to determine how uncertainties will be addressed, to determine how unanticipated events will be dealt with, or to determine how the project outcomes will be affected by climate change and sea level rise. Our opinion is that the documentation for a project of this scope and importance must exceed the minimal requirements 
in terms of legal aspects. It should provide comprehensive information that is clearly and understandably presented. We believe that this is needed to enable decision makers and the public to evaluate the project as a whole, not just as a collection of separate, incomplete pieces. The Council's view reflects our concerns about this in their review recommendation number two in the uh, document that's being considered today. Now in this revised EIR document, the development of adaptive management, which as was just mentioned in terms of the levy investment strategy, is critical in the uncertain environment of the Delta and is required by the Delta Plan and the Delta Perform Act. From our perspective, the discussion of adaptive management is inadequate. It deals only superficially with how it might be organized and not at all about how it would be conducted or how the impediments that have limited its use in the past will be surmounted. Moreover, many of our concerns we raised about adaptive management and some other topics in the pre our previous review of the draft BDC, P, EIR, EIS, persist in this current draft. We are also concerned about the inadequate communication of information conveyed. Chief among these is our growing dismay over the failure of the documents to provide clear summaries and graphics that would enable readers to reach firm conclusions about the scientific foundations of this project. In particular, the continuing absence of clear and concise descriptions of assumptions and uncertainties leave much hidden from view. So in summary, the Delta Independent Science Board found ourselves continually stymied by the lack of critical information, the lack of assurances that the information would adequately appear in the final draft, and the repeated claim that what was criti critical information to us should be that should be included was not legally required. Recently, four lead scientists, including Cliff Dom, Professor Dom, prepared a review of the challenges facing the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. And their conclusion that I'll read below reflects the intentions of the Delta Independent Science Board's comments on the partially recirculated revised EIR EIS. California has the tools and the intellectual resources to manage the multiple dimensions of this problem. All through these strengths, they can achieve the state's twin goals of reliable water supply and an ecologically diverse Delta ecosystem. Thank you for this opportunity to present and discuss our conclusions about the new documents. Dr. Resch, thank you. And on behalf of the council, I want to express our appreciation to you and your colleagues at the Independent Science Board for uh, all of the work that you do. You are 10 of the hardest working scientists in the nation. Uh, and and uh, we appreciate your focus on the Delta. We appreciate your focus on the BDCP EIR reviews, the, uh, the first and the most recent. And that's um, a very, uh, very clear report that we have received from you that is advising uh, the comments that, that we are going to submit as a council. So at this time, uh, council members, questions, uh, comments for Dr. Resch? Mary? Um, not for Dr. Well, I have one question for you, Dr. Yes. Resch. A minor, more higher elevation. Were you part of the original uh, effort with the BDCP analysis and this one? I'm just wondering your yes, relationship. I was. So you've I been there for both. both. For, okay. For Thank the you. past six years, yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dan? Yeah, so we, we in our staff report then have uh, appended a recommended letter, uh, both a cover letter uh, to be signed by you if the council approves uh, Mr. Fiorini, and then also uh, detailed comments on the various uh, elements of the EIRIS. Um, and uh, they're, they're attached as uh, attachments one and two to the staff report. Um, we're raising uh, six key points uh, in these letters. First is the importance, a reminder of the importance of uh, consistency with the Delta Plan. Because this, the BDCP, the water fix, will no longer be, meet the standards of a, if the preferred alternative is approved of a natural communities conservation plan, uh, they'll re be required to certify its consistency with the Delta Plan. 
and that will require that they have an adequate adaptive management plan and uh, adequate provisions for funding it, as well as that the uh, um, uh, project that's proposed is based on the best available science. And so that's one of the reasons that it's important that the um, BDCP agencies consider and respond to the uh, ISB's comments, which we have attached uh, to our, which we'll attach to our staff, uh, to the staff comments as well. And uh, we've asked them in the cover letter to respond to them as if they had been submitted by the council. That's how we handled it the last time as well. Um, the uh, second concern we've identified, and this is described on page three of our detailed comments. Uh, is the development of a comprehensive and stable project description. Um, while much of the water fix project is uh, described pretty completely in the EIR, other key elements are going to depend on regulatory decisions, particularly how the project is operated. And it would uh, be important that as they complete those regulatory filings and perhaps if some of the um, regulatory actions take place before the EIR EIS is finalized, that that final project description reflect and be fully informed by the uh, regulatory actions that they anticipate. Uh, the third issue is uh, still continued concerns about water quality. We raised this in the draft, uh, comments on the draft EIR last year. As uh, Dr. Resch pointed out, there is an improved analysis of uh, water quality impacts, and that, that's uh, good to see. Um, they're no longer, for example, all, you know, and that's helped them understand that perhaps the impacts won't be as significant as uh, they had initially forecast, so that now, for example, they're no longer proposing to shift the compliance point for salinity on the Sacramento River. They're no longer proposing to push that inland, and so that's good to see. Uh, but the EIR does uh, point out that the, evalu the evaluation tools that they've used for water quality are more comparative so they can choose between alternatives and understand what water quality impacts benefits of one alternative versus another might be. They're more comparative than predictive. And so and that's one of these that they uh, talk, talked about with the ISB. So it's to us emphasize the importance of having a good uh, monitoring program for water quality uh, outcomes as they finalize the EIR and its uh, mitigation and reporting plan. And also the importance of mitigation measures. One of the things that Arcade has pointed out to us now is that uh, the mitigation process puts uh, quite a bit of the burden on identifying and implementing uh, mitigation measures for water quality impacts on in-delta users. And maybe uh, uh, there's ways to rebalance that. Um, one of the new uh, effects of the project is a result of one of the benefits of the project uh, in terms of its redesign. You recall in, uh, I think it was January, we heard from DWR how they were proposing to realign the tunnels to the east so that they're no longer as close to Lock and Walnut Grove and uh, don't uh, go under uh, Staten Island, require so many facilities on Staten Island. That's good because we've reduced impacts on those two communities and um, also on the cranes that use Staten Island. The result of that, however, though, is they've moved the facilities uh, under the McCormick-Williamson tract and other areas that we've identified in the Delta Plan as being a high priority for future habitat restoration. And the regulatory policies of the plan require that the opportunities to restore those areas in the future be protected or uh, mitigated. Um, there's very little analysis in the EIR about how the facilities they propose in that high priority restoration area uh, would uh, be affected by the facilities they propose. Um, that includes a, uh, a barge unloading facility and a temporary uh, tunnel, re tunnel material storage site that would be um, Snodgrass Slough just north of the McCormick-Williamson tract, as well as um, the potential uh, need to drill a tunnel, uh, a shaft through the middle of the McCormick-Williamson tract. Um, and those are not very well described in the EIR and the impacts that they would have both on the opportunity to restore the uh, habitats there as well as other impacts are not very clearly analyzed. Uh, on the south end of the uh, delta, there's a uh, uh, operable gate proposed on the old river that's a long been part of the project and there is some assessment of how it might affect opportunities to restore habitats within that high priority uh, habitat restoration area on the San Joaquin but that analysis can be built out so those are important issues that are new to this project. Uh, 
better measures to mitigate other effects on wetlands and aquatic habitats are also important. Some of the ISB comments address those and we've called a few other uh, points to their attention. That's one of the ways we've echoed the ISB's uh, concerns. And then finally, and this was a major point uh, that we made in our letter on the draft EIR as well, a better evaluation and mitigation of impacts to the unique values of the Delta is also uh, important. We think they can do a better job both of uh, identifying and evaluating effects and particularly in mitigating effects uh, across a wide variety of uh, impact categories that will affect particularly the areas uh, at Hood and near Clarksburg that are nearest the construction sites, but also other communities on um, Highway 160 and then uh, people who are living in the Sa San Joaquin and South Delta areas that are affected by the construction. So um, I can answer any questions you might have about the letter. I'd be happy to do so. Uh, but otherwise, our suggestion is that the council, after your discussion, uh, authorize the chairman to submit the uh, comments with such revisions as you'd like to make. And there's a, uh, a model uh, motion for you on the last page of the staff report. Dan, thank you. And <clears throat> thank you for that reminder that this is an action item. Comments, questions? Mary, your light's on. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one, I think the council should... Um, look at the principles, as I mentioned earlier, and that we discussed yesterday and how they might apply to this comment letter or to this project. So again, my question would be, are we marrying those principles as they're evolving to this effort? Yeah, I, th I think we have in our comments uh, really even more so on the, um, the uh, draft EIR last year. Huh kind of paved the way for some of our understanding that right. went here. One of the comments that uh, we made and that they, uh, I believe, is partly addressed in the CIER and there'll be further evaluation, I think, as they move into the final is understanding the, how the BDCP, together with other water supply mm -hmm. improvements that are foreseeable, such as the storage facilities that are being evaluated uh, in the Sacramento Valley, as well as uh, those that are being under considered in the San Joaquin, how those fit together. Uh, c comprehensively and what the cumulative impacts of that would be. So that's one of the ways in which uh, we're doing that. Um, and I think, too, we understand that the uh, importance of having flexibility in, in conveyance facilities and an operations program that respects the environmental uh, needs of the Delta are also reflected in these comments here. So it's our intention to m marry the principles as we're adopting them and moving that forward with this. Yeah, and we've, okay. tried, we've tried to use yeah. those as guides uh, as we're moving ahead on a variety of things. Yeah. And I think we need to be careful about the balancing of co-equal goals towards achieving the co-equal goals. And there's a s distinction between the language that achievement of the co-equal goals should be the council's uh, primary goal uh, and objective. And last, um, on that topic, if the water fix doesn't contribute to the achievement of both co-equal goals, um, it's not consistent then with the Delta Reform Act. And I would seek guidance maybe from Mr. Stevens that are we identifying enough where inadequacies may exist in the draft EIR in relationship to CEQA or NEPA, if there are any, and, and if there are, are we seeking corrective action with our comments sufficiently as they relate to the 2009 Delta Reform Act? And again, is the basis for our foundation existence, the Delta Reform Act mm -hmm. as amended in 2009, mm -hmm. we have those responsibilities. Yeah, I feel uh, that, that- We've sought that. Yeah, I, I think that okay. the staff has done a, a fine job on the letter and uh, it's actually strikes a reasonable, uh, fair tone um, in terms of expectations consistent with the Reform Act as well as as Dan said, with the evolving nature of the principles, and um, so this this puts us in a good place. I think that that uh, again, from my perspective, and it, I think it echoes what the council said. We appreciate the the role of the independent science board in in providing its its uh, independent advice to inform our our letter, and they've they've done so in the past. Um, I think as the, as the project moves forward, what the council should strive to do is 
um, and I think this has been a theme throughout the council's existence, especially with regard to potential covered actions, um, well, which may result from this project here mm -hmm. if, if FIX is the chosen alternative, um, is, is that we strive for early consultation and no surprises with regard to the, the project proponents. So some of the big issues that are raised, not only by the Independent Science Board, but by our incorporation of their right. comments, have to, to do with adaptive management and best available science. Very important, but in some people's opinions, um, uh, the definition I is not always certain and, and somewhat amorphous. Um, so fundamental concepts um, that we have to struggle with um, in terms of looking forward to early consultation, meeting with the project proponents, and making sure that there are no surprises. So there, I think that the council and the staff um, recognize that there are going to be disagreements over whether or not the project is the right project. But what we should strive to do, in my opinion, is to make sure that the project proponents are clear as to what the expectations are to be consistent with the Delta plan ultimately. Right. I think this, this uh, comment letter will help to pave the way, but I think that if the, the fix is the preferred alternative, we have some more work ahead of us and it behooves us all to make sure that the expectations are clear. So well, and I think there's work ahead and behind, I think is part of my point is that we're created to achieve the COE, the Stewardship Council is created to achieve the co-equal goals under the 2009 Delta Reform Act, and then we are also required to create the Delta Plan uh, in the covered actions that are moving forward. So we're wearing two hats in that sense, so to speak. Um, I'm seeking guidance from you, Chris. Are we, are we confident that we've protected CEQA and NEPA in our comment letter here under the Delta Reform Act requirements, which is our initial responsibility, sure. if not co-responsibility? Sure. Well, you know, I, I think that we have. Good. I think that's the that's answer. That's the answer I want. I think that the the our ultimate goal is successful implementation of the Delta Plan, and the Delta Plan as a whole, in the aggregate, um, will, if implemented uh, appropriately, achieve the co-equal goals. Mm -hmm. We've already got in our own regulations, implementing regulations, a definition of what achieving each of the co-equal exactly. goals is, and that's that was actually a footnote to your principles yesterday. Mm -hmm. So let's keep that in mind. Exactly. Uh, again, it, it, it's clear in that definition, which reflects the Delta Reform Act itself, that improved conveyance is a piece of achieving the co-equal goal of water supply reliability. Again, we look at it as a package, so it should also help to achieve the other co-equal goal in a way that is true to Delta as a place mm -hmm. um, requirements mm -hmm. as well. But the big, the big concern from our perspective is successful implementation of the Delta plan. Um, and so I think that this, this letter and this potential project can be uh, uh, a piece of that, but um, the, the, let's keep in mind what the ultimate goal is, um, successfully implementing our plan. Thank you so much. Um, and Mr. Chairman, um, on page nine of the report, and I don't know how important this is, but I'll make a, it's a repetitive point in my comments. In the third paragraph under um, item nine, evaluation mitigation of impacts to unique delta values, uh, th the third paragraph on the page reads, nevertheless, the new alternatives will still have significant adverse effects on the Delta's unique values that should be more thoroughly assessed and better mitigated. I'm wondering in this context, and I'll bring up another one, why we don't have avoided in there. Would we prefer avoidance first? And if it can't be avoided, then uh, if assessed, then avoided preferably, and if not avoided, then better mitigated? It just seems to be a, pri a sense of priorities for me versus just accepting um, the significant adverse effect. Okay, that would be a comment. And then in the letter itself, my apologies. Uh, and Dan, you commented on the California water fix fitting together with other comprehensive 
solutions for statewide water management. And I agree that this uh, conveyance and, and uh, the plumbing is part of that overall view, but they're not tied together. California Water Fix hasn't tied water storage into the fix. Um, nor is it tied together with any other comprehensive solutions. So is that a point we would like to make or should we make in our comments that the council would see this in part as meeting the needs of the state, not a sole project? Because it's losing that, con it's, it's, it's being looked at in isolation from the entirety of the system. Well, I, uh, and, I, and I've, this is where my, my knowledge of, of the requirements under the law come from being a practitioner, not a lawyer, so I always <laughs> have to be uh, cautious. I, th I think that they've done a reasonable job in describing the kind of geographic scope of the pro their project. Um, our comments in the EIR the last time, our draft comments said, that's fine, but you need to, in your cumulative impact section, mm -hmm. think through how this is going to work together with other reasonably foreseeable projects. And the draft that they recirculated now improves on that analysis. And I suspect we'll see additional improvements because they're still responding to comments on the draft from last July. They're still responding to those comments. I think we'll see additional evaluation of that in the uh, final. So I, I don't, you know, there are many things we said in the original uh, letter, and I think we reiterated mm -hmm. uh, those in, in the cover letter in terms of things we thought were important to deal with. And um, I think they'll, uh, we can be confident that that'll be taken care of as we move ahead. Yeah. Okay. And then, Mr. Chairman, lastly, on page three of our staff report, um, items D and E is another area we, we are recommend, I'm sorry, recognizing significant impact and our recommendation is to, for um, the agency to better describe mitigation for impacts or wetlands and aquatic habitats and down in E specify performance standards that will mitigate the project's significant impacts. I really would think we should seek avoidance before we accept significant impacts. Uh, avoidance first and then mitigation. I just think that would, uh, and again, I understand that's in the staff report, but I think it should be yeah. part of our uh, I think effort. that is a point we made uh, in, the, in the comments about uh, wetlands and other aquatic habitats, but I think your point's well made about the approach to the impacts on unique delta values. They've done, I, I think, we, I, you know, my own mind, I give them credit for the changes they've made in the project that have reduced impacts, particularly in the North Delta, and your communities in the South Delta uh, suffer a little more impact as a result. Um, but I, I, I think these guys have done quite a bit of work to try to avoid impact. So far, maybe there's more that can be done. Yeah. I, th I think that's the point. There's more that could be done and possibly should be done, and we just want to make sure we, we have a high goal, not a low one, a high aspiration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Judge, did you have a question? All right. Phil. Well, I want to repeat what I said two months ago when we got the, uh, I think it was two months ago, when DR, DWR responded to the Science Board report. I thought it was a cavalier dismissal of the Science Board comments, kind of a pat on the head, and neither politically wise nor governmentally sound, since it is consistency with the Delta plan that a covered action will be based upon in front of this council. and. I understand the difficult job they've got of trying to identify problems, but just taking the most fundamental issue the science board raised, which is, gee, there is no clarity on the adaptive management and best available science. And it's, the, you didn't say it this way, uh, Vince, but uh, the, the, the tendency is to try to punt on issues that are complicated and difficult to resolve. The reality is everybody's promised to do, I mean, adaptive management's legally required for us, but it's also part of the law in many other cases. They've already said they want to do it. The question is what, when, where, and how much is spent, and who pays? I mean, that's, that's the deal. And that, of course, raises the hackles of the water contractors and the interested parties, all of whom want to reduce their spending and not have uh, uh, Dr. Rush's of the world uh, interfere with whatever they want to do with the, with the project. But for 
the state of California and for the council, we've got to have as complete a set of documents as possible. And that's why couching this in terms of expectations, which I think is a smart way to do it, is sensible. But the pressure uh, represented by the, the response uh, documents that were uh, sent to the si uh, in response to the science board will show that there's a natural inclination to push things over when they can't resolve them right away. If this is not prejudging the merits of the proposal, but I do want to make a comment on the availability and our ability to exercise an opinion on uh, the sufficiency of the record. If the final proposal that comes to us lacks sufficient clarity on these points raised by the science board and articulated on the staff, or if it defers their construction, their financing, their implementation to an uncertain date in the future, believing that good intentions once stated is, should be enough, well, the record is incomplete, in my judgment, to make a determination. And I do not believe that the advocates of the project would like to have that result, so therefore clarity, as the staff report suggests, is, is I think is in the ultimate best interest of the project. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I, I was, um, I had one technical question, uh, if I could please ask it on page one of the review comments, the detailed thing, and Chris, you may have to weigh in on this. At the bottom of that section, Roman numeral two, sub A, the first sentence issue, if the California water fix is ultimately chosen as the project, DWR will need to certify fix is consistent with the Delta plan. But then the next sentence, in addition, the BDCP EIR should fulfill the requirements of water codes. Explain that sentence to me, please. <laughs> you can do the first one. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. no. Oh, no, well, you, you know, don't. You're going to do both. Well, you know, the provisions of the uh, water code regarding the development of the BDCP specify unique requirements I agree. of the EIR yeah. that should be and provided. And that's the sequel language, yeah. the section, yeah. the sub yeah. two. Yeah. But what does it mean? And this, con I, I just so, didn't understand. So uh, the way that the... the Cal Water Fix alternative um, is being presented in the public draft. They've used the existing BDCP uh, EIR. EIR. And so I think the point here is that we're recommending, since the BDCP is still uh, a viable alternative because they're using that document. They haven't chosen yet. That's my understanding, that yeah. they haven't chosen yet, that it's still a feasible alternative. We're recommending that since that's still in play, the applicable provisions of the Delta Reform Act should be complied with. So, that, so they should go through that analysis, okay. uh, the uh, CEQA analysis that's laid out. Could I, could for I the make BCP. a suggestion? That I didn't draw that conclusion from reading this sentence. I, I just didn't understand yeah. it. Well, but, but if, if, if what we want to say is, look, guys, you've laid out alternatives, your EIR is studying the alternatives, it's now under CEQA, it's not under the others, but you've kept the BDCP alternative for purposes of analysis, which the law, re at least our statute, requires you to provide all the relevant information as if that were operational. So you can't avoid doing that just because you've kind of signaled the fact that you're going to choose a lesser alternative without that. I mean, you can't have it both ways. Is that, so, Chris, I, I just didn't. So uh, I think that we can probably clarify that. Yeah, because um, it's, it, it seems to me that's an important point in terms of providing information requested by the science board, requested by the staff draft, okay. and is not inconsistent with their current legal position. Uh, no, I understand why not. they don't want to do it. That's different. But th this just allows us to make a consistency determination yeah. with the uh, information in front of us. Okay. Uh, so if you could take a look at that sentence, I just, not sure how you should write it. Then uh, I, I do have one suggestion. Uh, on page two of the draft letter, because I consider the science board comments so important for us, but more important for the state of California. 
and they are the sole independent scientific critique to date. Randy, my suggestion to you is you take the last sentence of the middle paragraph, which reads, as you consider the ISB comments, please respond as if they had been submitted by the council, and run it right in front of the letter. I'd start that way. That's me. Because to me, that is honoring our legal requirement, which says that the Delta plan must, shall meet all of the following, be based on the best available science information and the independent science advice provided by the Delta Independent Science Board. I'd put that right out there so there is no mistaking the importance of that point. Why can't we just uh, quote the, the statute and then add this sentence? Yeah, that. I mean, quote the statute. I, I, I don't care where it goes. But yeah, it says the Delta. This is section eight five three zero eight. The Delta plan shall meet all the following requirements, and A quote. is be based on the best available scientific information and the independent science. I mean, it's it's there. I mean, yeah. it just hits you in the face. So the recommendation would be to include that in the cover letter. Well, uh, it's move it up. Yeah, the reference, but I would move it up mm -hmm. because or bold face it or something. That's, that is fundamental to what this process to date for us is all about, and it's what the science board said, the importance of answering legitimate questions within the context of this proposal. Uh, we probably have to include a caveat that the independent science board that's advising us uh, chose to go beyond the legal requirements of the traditional EIR document and has offered advice on I, I, I on make a, that's that. why I asked the technical question on page one of the report and and Chris pointed out that while it's true a CEQA standalone might not require those analysis the proponents have chosen to keep as an alternative, they are studying in the EIR the NCCP alternative. And to argue that therefore, well, we don't have to answer what the NCCP would require even if we're considering it, boy, that's, that's grounds for reversal. Yeah, they can't do that at, at the end of the day. They gotta answer at least the questions, even if they choose an alternative that's standing alone, if they start it all over again, might not require it. And to be clear, I don't think that's I don't their think position. That's a, no, I don't yeah. think it is either. And, and I think if we look at the, what those unique requirements, I think there's seven of them, or six of them. The one that's most relevant to the comments we're making now is the requirement that they consider the effects on water quality. Yeah. Uh, the other key provisions were ones that we had gone through previously and uh, are, I think, awaiting the final EIR and we anticipate that they would be addressed in that process. You know, there's a, this, this report that Cliff and the gang produced yesterday, there is a terrific little section back here that is helpful, I, almost <laughs> explaining the issue. It's the one that talks about the, um, the dispute over uh, water supply in the Delta and what role it plays on the statewide supply and what role it also plays on the uh, uh, environmental water versus water quality. It's not as if it hadn't been said before, but if you listen to the public debate on water generally, it is that little fish are taking 176% of all the water that's otherwise divine for people. And, you know, whether it's this report, whether it's the PPIC reports, whether it's DWR reports is, it, that it ain't true. And it might be useful to reference this. Let me suggest another draft. Uh, why don't we separate uh, that paragraph that begins first attached document. That's a separate paragraph. The second attached document, or it could be the first one for that matter, but I, I mean, I think it, 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 in, in difference to, I think the comments are correct that uh, uh, Phil made. Maybe the first attachment should be the report by the Independent Science Board, and then cite the statute and continue on with that. Uh, is, is there any reason why one, one attachment is first and one second? Well, I, I think the reason is that these are, are our staff comments. The Independent Science Board also separately submitted their comments right, the, on the project. Fine. So. The list, you can use the first attachment to make the, the, the staff report, but the second attachment should be a separate paragraph 
and then that should be, and then to incorporate the, the, the language of the statute that, that Phil cited. I think that's important to underscore the mm -hmm. significance of this. Take, we can do that. That's, I don't recall exactly how we presented our comments the last time, but it sounds, what we're suggesting is very similar. Mm -hmm. Yes. By the way, Randy, the, uh, Mary the, the, and the I'm sorry, the chart I, I mentioned in this report appears on page 21 called How Much Water for the Environment, mm -hmm. which I thought was one of the simpler explanations that the public political debate is not always related to the facts of the circumstance. Okay, thanks for that. Mary? Uh, and to that point, uh, the bullet, most of the controversy over the supply of water is over the 1% 1% or so of the water used to protect endangered species of fish. So I, th I too thought that was an interesting point in the report. So thank you, Cliff, for that. Um, and I is, support is that, council member. That's 1% of the 200,000 yeah. acre feet that fall annually right. in good years, um, average years. I fully support uh, council members uh, consideration to put the independent science board report in the front of the letter, breaking out the paragraph as Judge Damerill has suggested. And I would just add one brief uh, addition where we, where we talk about the ISB completing its review and make part of that our council's comments. I think we could further identify its independence by re stating it's an independent review and then the ISB's recommendations are independent. That yes, we agree with them. Yes, we want to move it forward. We want to highlight them. We want to make them part of our comments. But we also want to highlight that they are fully independent of any council determination or staff input. I mean, it's all the science boards. So it elevates not only the concerns that the ISB has commented on, but that they are truly an independent body. And I think that might be an important clarification for others to consider them um, in relation to our comments and the ISBs. Okay. Anything else? Last, last comment. As, as, we, as we get to the end of the, what we now call water fix and eco restore and all of that, the tensions will increase on issues that really shouldn't deserve. I just want to commend the staff for working their way through the complexities with all the political tensions that are out there. And it's, it's, it's a uh, it's first rate job in constructing the comments. And I understand the difficulties and I just appreciate the work a lot. And to the science board people, thank you for the, uh, thank you for remaining independent as a group of scientists. Thank you for that. So um, this is an action item. Are we ready to, um, Take action. Did you want to seek any public comment on this item? Uh, I think we would like to, oh. but we don't have any uh, requests. So. Then, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would be happy to uh, accept staff's recommendations as they've been provided to all of us and further work with you on the finalization of the letter to take in the comments that we have all made and uh, have that be supported in the documentation and communication moving forward. Okay, we have a motion or second, Eisenberg seconds. Um, the um, discussion items that you're referencing are specifically on in our letter um, section 2A, a clarification of the reference to the water code section. Okay, okay. And then um, clarifying the role of the independent science board citing the statute uh, as they are to advise us and to emphasize that they are an independent science group. Was there anything else? Yes, in the, um, where we're talking about significant impacts or frankly any impacts, we don't just avoid seek mitigation, first, then we minimize. seek avoidance first and then mitigation. Thank you, Jessica. Okay, okay, so um, uh, that's to clarify the motion. Uh, and yes. The second is okay with that clarification, all right. Any uh, discussion on the motion? I think we're ready for the vote. Tatai and I. PFO I. Damerill I. Fiorini I. Eisenberg I. Motion carries unanimously. That concludes file item number 15. File item. Real briefly, I, I think we would you know, think about what comes next here. Because this has been almost the easy part, trying to get these letters out. And now uh, the real. Wait a minute, wait a minute. 
You said that's the easy part? Almost the easy part. Almost. But uh, as, as, as Chris pointed out, you know, the, the key next steps are kind of the continuing consultation with the BDCP agencies about the project. Uh, we've had conversations through the science program and our, our lead scientists about the adaptive management program and that's clearly a thing that we all know uh, we need to be working on uh, to finally move that into sh uh, shape that we think we've got something effective. Um, they're also, they'll be seeking, as we pointed out, the permits from the FIS agencies and the water board and it seems like that'll happen over uh, the dozen or so months, so the council has the opportunity to participate in the water board's hearings, and uh, we'll need to be thinking about that with you, about what, if any, role you want to play in that. We're expecting an economic impact report to be updated. They did one on the uh, draft BDCP when it was released last year, and I'm told an update will be available. And uh, the water contractors are going to need to make some decisions also during this coming months about uh, their commitment to the project and that may have obvious impacts so it'll be a while before we get to certification of the Delta plan and we hope to use this consultation process and the uh, opportunity to participate in other decisions as a way to move your uh, 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 move ahead the issues you've called to our attention. All right. Well, I don't think it was so easy, and I want to acknowledge all the work of the many people on staff that um, spent a lot of time and effort in, in distilling our comments down to um, these pages. And again, compliments to the Independent Science Board for the work that you have done to advise us to help us put our comments together. Jessica, any final comments on this matter? All right. Then um, next item is uh, general public comment. Anybody have anything to say about anything? Uh, hearing, hearing. Well, that's what it's for. <laughs> that's what it's for. Do, do you want to say something about anything? All right. Um, so um, this leads us to uh, adjourning the meeting. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you next month. <laughs>